He packed in the animals two by two, oxen, camel, and kangaroo. I packed them in that ark so tight, I couldn't get no sleep that night. I called the road, Jeb, Shep, and Ham, talking about God's master plan. Oh, my Lord, 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 Lord. Oh, my Lord, 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 Lord. Oh, 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 oh. The movie Glory was released in 1989, and for many individuals it was the first time they learned that blacks had participated in the American Civil War. Now, there were two culminating battles at the end of the movie. The first was the Battle of Grimble's Landing, and the second was the Battle of Fort Wagner. The first time that the Union Army attempted operations at James Island, South Carolina, was at the Battle of Secessionville on June 16, 1862. It was the Union's only attempt to capture Charleston by land. The Union had employed the Anaconda Plan, which was a strategy to strangle the Confederacy by cutting it off from outside assistance. Charleston was important because in the words of Robert E. Lee, the loss of Charleston would cut us off almost entirely from communications with the rest of the world and close the only channel through which we can expect to get supplies from abroad. Now almost our only dependence. The Union Army was repelled. Frederick Douglass was instrumental in recruiting troops for both the 54th and 55th Massachusetts. Amongst the first 23 individuals he recruited, two of them were his own sons, Charles Raymond Douglass and Louis Henry Douglass. Now, although both brothers enlisted with the 54th Massachusetts, on March 26, 1863, Charles signed on with the 5th Massachusetts Colored Cavalry. Lewis remained in the 54th, and he rose to the rank of Sergeant Major. After reaching full strength, the 54th Massachusetts departed for South Carolina on May 28th. Union forces began arriving on James Island on July 8th. Both sides had a division strength at around 3,000 men. On July 11th, the 7th Connecticut Infantry, supported by naval bombardment, attacked the fort. They sustained heavy casualties, losing 339 men. On Thursday, July 16th, the Confederates attacked the 10th Connecticut Infantry with the intent of encircling and destroying them. The regiment was in danger of being cut off but the Confederate efforts to get around them were checked by the men of the 54th that rebuffed a series of Confederate attacks, allowing the Connecticut men to escape. Primary sources attest to the fact that the 54th saved the lives of the Connecticut soldiers. The 54th suffered 43 casualties. And just by the way of passing the term amphibious assault, describes a type of offensive military operation that uses naval ships to project ground and air power onto a hostile or potentially hostile and probably fortified shore at a designated landing beach and that is always a difficult operation. A lesson that military philosophers would revisit well into the 20th century. This battle was the first engagement for the men of the 54th. During the final hours of July 17th, the men of the 54th began to embark on the steamer, the General Hunter, and their only method of getting to the ship was by way of a boat which only carried about 30 men. There was a thunderstorm that night accompanied with heavy rain. The men endured the monsoon that soaked 
their uniforms and their equipment. The transfer took all night and it didn't culminate until around 5 a.m. Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, commander of the regiment, could have long before been in a comfortable dry cabin, but he chose to weather the storm with his men and he was with the last group of men to ferry to the steamer. On board, the officers were able to procure breakfast for the men. Although they didn't know it, this would be the last time that these officers would be together. The steamer reached its destination at 9 a.m. and as the men disembarked, soldiers from other regiments came out and cheered them and they were aware of what the 54th did the day before. The men marched an additional six miles and waited for their next mode of transportation. They could see the naval bombardment in the distance. They boarded a small steamer at about 5 p.m. They landed on the beaches of Morris Island. Did I mention that amphibious assault was extremely difficult? Fort Wagner was referred to as the strongest single earthwork known in the history of warfare. At about 4 p.m., firing from the fort ceased. It was believed that the fort had been rendered helpless. The decision was made to attack that evening. At 6 p.m., the 54th was brought to the front of the attack column. There were other regiments slated for the attack. The men were tired and they had not eaten since early that morning and they had not received rations for two days. The assault began at 7.45 p.m. It turned out that the fort was not neutralized. The men faced artillery shot, shell, canister, and grape shot, as well as an enfilade of small arms fire coming from elevated positions. The events transpired so quickly and by the time they reached the walls of the fort, their ranks had been decimated. Colonel Shaw stood atop the wall, held up his sword and yelled to his men, forward 54. Then he fell dead, shot through the heart. The charge of the 54th had been repulsed before any of the supporting Union regiments could engage. They began the attack with 600 men and they lost 45% of their manpower. That was a bloodbath. And as for the regiments that followed in support, they sustained heavy casualties too. What the 54th did on July 16th and 18th was a testimony that would help prove that blacks could and would defend the nation. As a result, of the over 209,000 blacks who participated in the Union War effort. After the war, the United States military authorized black troops, the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments, and the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the latter to be known as Buffalo Soldiers. Of course, African Americans would continue to defend the country as they do today, and all of them were and are standing on the shoulders of those USCTs who helped preserve the Union. This is John W. McCaskill, History Alive. Check out our website at www.jwmhistoryalive.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you want more films, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel at John W. McCaskill. This is John W. McCaskill, History Alive.